Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, this is Dr. Shane. I am sitting behind the camera right now, and we are actually in a separate location. Uh, some of you have gone through D2L and seen all of this. This is nothing new. This is actually uh, where I go to church in Carlisle in the choir room. So we're not going to be doing any singing inside anytime soon since that's one of the most dangerous ways of spreading contagions like the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So uh, we are grateful though to have this facility and has a great whiteboard and uh, we can do a lot of teaching doing this. Okay, so I'm gonna come out uh, in front of the camera now. Okay, so um, at this point, hopefully uh, we have had a class meeting and maybe fumbled through some of the technology there. Uh, perhaps you have watched the introductory video that I made just about how we're going to structure the course and I made that in another room at Franklin Science Center which had a bunch of background noise so it wasn't really the best. This room seems to be pretty good for that. The only disadvantage to this room, uh, you can't see them with the camera, but these big glass windows in the room when the sun starts to come in, there's a bit of glare on the board which some students said it was a little hard to read but we dealt with it. Okay, so. Why are we making these videos? These videos are a supplement to what happens in lecture. Also, in the case that we go completely virtual, we will then switch over into doing a flipped classroom. And what that means is that you essentially will be responsible for doing most of the content, and then whenever we meet, we're just gonna work on problems, which is probably what we're gonna do anyway. I think that's going to be the best use of our time when we meet in one of those large classrooms. And I'm working on a way to figure that out. I actually just ordered a pretty fancy tablet computer. So when we get together, I can write on the tablet and have it appear on the screen and on the computer screen. I think that'll work pretty well for remote instruction. But I'm not there yet. So my goal is for the first two weeks of class to be prepared for completely flipped virtual instruction if we go that route. And if we do, it's fine. I've done it before, we know what to do, we can get it done. Okay, so not to make these videos too long, uh, some of them will be really long, some of them won't. You can start them, stop them. If all of this material is, new, is old to you, you've seen it 20 times in previous coursework, fast forward through the video. Start the homework problems. Skip all of this if you know it all already. That's fine, just get the job done. Okay. Before we get started here today, uh, I'll put like a checklist of things you should do really before we start this lesson. And you should have done this already. On D2L, there's two things I've asked you to do. To put an introductory statement into the discussion board, there's a whole bunch of things I wanted you to give me information on, and to sign and upload the honor code. So hopefully by now, those are done. Before you listen to this lesson, I'm not going to rewrite everything that's on a PowerPoint slide up here. That's a waste of time. It's a waste of your time. It's a waste of my time. And it's unnecessary. So a little bit of preparation is good so you're not just sitting with blank paper waiting to write down everything I say. So we're not going to do it that way. So you want the week one PowerPoint slides off of D2L. You also want the week one assignments list, which tells you by certain days do everything. And I'm, I'm repeating all of that, so I don't mean to insult your intelligence. So on the week one assignments, one of the first two things I've asked you to do, I don't remember the wording, I don't have it sitting in front of me, is to memorize the Greek prefixes. Like what does milli mean? What does micro mean? What does nano mean? Those are very important prefixes for science and they do a lot of work for us if you understand them. Also, they give us a sense of scale. Where do we use nanometers versus where do we use millimeters? Where would we draw that line. It's very important. It may seem simple, but it's very important. So you want to memorize those. It's table, I forget what it is in the book, table 1.2 or something like that. Maybe it's 1.4. I don't remember. Look them up. Also, you want to look at the base units of measurement. What's the base unit for mass? What's the base unit for length? What's the base unit for time? We're going to do some of that. And you want to get, you want to look at all of that before this lesson. So make sure you can check all of those boxes before this lesson gets started. So if you need to stop the video and go look at the book and maybe make some flashcards or something, go ahead and do that. That's going to make this lesson go a lot faster. So stop the video and do all of that and then come back in. If you're ready to go, let's go. No, that's not erasing very well. That's okay. <laughs> Must be an old eraser. I'll get some, I'll get a rag and change that later. So, the first thing we're going to do in this first video, which is going to be a little short, 
is, oh yeah, remember we're trying to prepare for a flipped or inverted classroom here, is, I think I mentioned this already, I do pretty basic note taking. I kind of just do an outline, so Roman numeral one is measurement and uh, calculations. Fine, so you can make those headings in your notes, section 1.4 to 1.6. Uh, the first subheading is basic concepts, so you can make that heading, I'm not gonna do all that here. And then the first thing under that is the basics of measurement. I'm just, I have the PowerPoint slides here, so I'm not gonna write all this down, is that every measurement has three parts to it. It has a number, uh, or value, whatever you want to call it. It has a unit associated with it and some kind of error that's involved. And that's really important to also remember. There's an error associated with that. So I'm just going to give you some examples here. And this may be all that I do for this first part of the video because I may do the next two a little bit longer combining the Greek prefixes and the units and then doing some calculations. So, so that's, this one will be pretty short to get us started, okay? Just to kind of get our feet, get our feet wet, if you will. Okay, so uh, in your notes, this is what I normally would be writing on the board instead of uh, what's on the PowerPoint slides. This is just a table of different kinds of lab instruments that you'll use. So the instrument itself, what is it measuring? What's an example measurement that would be made? Is it a base unit? Or is it a derived unit? Meaning that you do something to that unit. Okay, like uh, a pound, for example. A pound is pretty common, we use that all the time. Like I weigh about 225 pounds. That's not a base unit. That's just kind of a historical unit that's been used that we carry over and still use. And then any notes I want to make about that. So if you want to take a minute and make this table or just write it down as I go across each line, that's fine. And uh, this gives us a chance to also work on some abbreviations. Okay, so an analytical balance, uh, some people would call these a scale or just a balance. The ones we have in the lab, which hopefully you'll get to see this semester, are really good. They go up to four decimal places. They're about $2,500 a piece, those analytical balances. They work really well. Well, what do they measure? They don't measure weight, they measure mass, which has an abbreviation M. Unfortunately, lowercase m, that's very important, that's lowercase m, uh, is also used for the Greek prefix milli, and it's also used as an abbreviation for the unit meter. So you have to understand what is it we're dealing with. So it's mass, it's milli, and it's meter all at once, but in context I think it makes sense. And our analytical balances are really good, and you can measure something like uh, 0 0.2391. Oh, um, let's see. So we need, what are the units there? Ah, okay. Well, grams. Now, is that the base unit? No, actually. Kilogram is the base unit for mass. So gram is actually derived. And a Greek prefix, you might know this already, putting a K in front means 10 to the third gram. So just to give you, so if I wanted to do a conversion graph, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. You don't have to write this part down. So um, 0.2391 grams is going to be equivalent to uh, 10 to the negative, whoops, excuse me. And I think I'm getting ahead of myself here for a little bit. I'm just gonna write the conversion up here. One kilogram, kilo means 10 to the third or a thousand. Or one gram is 10 to the negative third kilograms. 10 to the negative third. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. So this is a preview of coming attractions. If it's been a long time since you've dealt with this, if you just came from high school and you remember all this stuff, that's fine. So that's the little added bonus there. You don't have to write that down. So kilogram is our base measurement of mass. There's actually, uh, I 
think they still use it. They may have just changed this. An actual official kilogram chunk of metal in France that's the world standard for mass. I think that changed recently, so they have to look that one up. Okay, that's too much time on that one. Um, another piece of equipment that's pretty common in the lab is a 10 millimeter graduated cylinder. You've seen this before, just a tall glass cylinder with graduations on the side marks. Uh, it's a pretty terrible way of measuring volume, actually, because a lot of the water and solution remains stuck to the sides, adhering to the sides, so it's a really terrible way of measuring things like that. Um, and it measures, of course, volume, which is a capital V. That's a capital V. Lowercase v is velocity, which we don't use very often. And these can measure about, oh, well, that would be a reasonable measurement. One thing I forgot to back on the cycle back on is what's the error associated with these two instruments? We typically associate error by going to plus or minus. Plus or minus. A graduated cylinder, the error associated with that is plus or minus about a tenth of a millimeter. Oh, milli means 10 to the negative third. So one milliliter would be 10 to the negative third liters or 10 to the negative third liters would equal one milliliter, kind of like this. It's almost the exact opposite of Q. Mass, pretty good. Plus or minus, let's see, tens, hundreds, thousands. So plus or minus one ten thousandth of a gram. That's not bad for precision. That's why these things are so expensive. Uh, a better unit, a better, excuse me, a better instrument for measuring volume is a volumetric pipette. Well, it also measures volume. I'm not going to rewrite that. And it can get to much better precision. These typically can get two decimal place precision. Measuring volume precisely is very difficult. Very difficult to do. In fact, often what we'll do is we'll measure a mass and use density, mass over volume, to calculate the volume because mass is much more precise. We'll see that in the lab. So we get 10 times better precision on a volumetric pipette. I'm sorry, I'm in my church. I don't have all these things to demonstrate to you. A volumetric pipette looks like a long glass tube with a bulb in the middle uh, that measures just that volume. It doesn't measure between zero and two. It measures only two, but it does it very, very well. You'll see that in a while. Uh, stopwatch, that's pretty easy. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed something here. So milliliter. Milliliters are actually derived units. A note, a milliliter is equal to a cubic centimeter. It's a volume, so it's got three dimensions to it. That is a very useful piece of information to know. So you definitely want to know that. That one comes up all the time in this first part, and actually throughout science. Interestingly enough, There are no base units for volume, which seems strange. Why wouldn't we have a standard volume? Well, volume is a three-dimensional measurement. So why make it complicated? We have a base unit for a one-dimensional measurement, and then everything else is based on that. So if you go from a, a length in meters, you can go to an area in square meters, and you can go to a volume in cubic meters. So the base unit is actually one dimension rather than three. So there are no base units for volume, which is kind of an interesting thing to know. Uh, let's see, a stopwatch, that's pretty easy. That's measuring time, which is lowercase t, because a thermometer is uh, measuring temperature, which is capital T, because that's important. Symbols matter in science, so lowercase t, time, capital case t uh, is temperature, and a stopwatch is pretty easy here. So let's just pick up, it doesn't really matter, this could be your phone, and maybe it's better than this one, I'm just making this one up. So 3.5 seconds, plus or minus, well, it just depends on the stopwatch you're using. Maybe your stopwatch actually goes out to two decimal places. So I'm not going to worry about error on that one. Uh, let's see, uh, seconds are, that's nice. Seconds are a base unit of time. That's our standard worldwide unit for measuring time. 
and then we convert to hours, days, years, microseconds, nanoseconds, whatever you want to do. So there's no additional notes for that. A thermometer measures temperature, and let's stick to something we're going to do in the lab. Twenty point one degrees Celsius would be about room temperature, approximately. And most thermometers, you can get one decimal place precision. Okay. Um, oh, that's derived. That's a derived unit. Uh, Celsius is kind of arbitrary, actually. It's based on the boiling point of water, 100 degrees Celsius, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, remember that for later, and the freezing point of water, 0 degrees Celsius, or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Remember that for later, that comes in handy. But that's, that seems kind of arbitrary to see water as our base unit. No, it, it doesn't. Actually, the base unit there is something called Kelvin, which is symbolized with a capital K. Some of you may know this. You may have heard the concept of absolute zero, or zero Kelvin is as cold as things can get. Not exactly true, but we'll get to that later. So it's Kelvin is the base unit. Oops, I don't think I wrote that. Oh, why is that? Kelvin is based on molecular motion rather than an arbitrary standard like freezing and boiling water. Zero Kelvin, no molecular motion. And then you go up from there, you get more and more molecular motion. And we'll go into that later. Uh, I think I can whip through some of this. A ruler measures length. I'm not going to write the word length. The uh, symbol for length is typically a lowercase l. Sometimes it's written in a cursive. It looks a little strange. But lowercase l. And let's just use an example that's elementary. Maybe you measure 21.5 centimeters. A uh, hundred, let's see, what's a centimeter? There are a hundred centimeters in a meter. So a centimeter is 10 to the negative two meters. There's 10 millimeters in a centimeter. Those are good things to know. We'll get to those later. Uh, let's see, a centimeter, oh, by the way, I'm always going back to these units before, is gram derived milliliter, milliliter, centimeter. Uh, that's a derived unit. Centimeter is a derived unit. The meter, not a yard, not a yard. Uh, incidentally, the United States, I think, is one of only three countries in the world that has not officially adopted the metric system, primarily for economic reasons, because it would just be so expensive. And in this day and age, it's really easy to go back and forth. So maybe it's not that big of a deal, but we can debate that sometime if you want. So the meter is the base, and lowercase m is the same as lowercase m here is the same as lowercase m there, but they all have three different meanings. Keep that in mind. So the meter is the base unit there. Okay, I'm trying to keep this lined up. This table's looking a little sloppy. Something I may have shown you, and you maybe saw it on the slides, is a barometer. Uh, a barometer is what measures atmospheric pressure. And I'm waving my hands around, so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You can Google how a barometer works. But basically, you put a dish of liquid and put a tube in it. Fill the tube with that liquid, turn it upside down, and air pressure pushing down the liquid forces it up the tube. And you measure the air pressure by measuring the length of the liquid in the tube. And the liquid we typically use is mercury. If we used water, we would need a tube about 35 feet high. So we use a dense liquid there. And the barometer measures pressure. You can write the word pressure if you want to, but this video is getting a little too long. It's capital P. Capital P for pressure. And um, there's a picture of a barometer Actually, the barometer from our lab on the PowerPoint slides if you want to go back and take a look at it. And so you look at the side of the barometer, and there's a little measuring device that I can't really explain it here. And say you measure something like 740.2, and the units on that are actually millimeters, so mm, two m's, millimeters. And since the liquid in there is mercury, we use the elemental symbol for mercury, which is Hg, derived from Latin. We're not going to get into that. 
and plus or minus 0 0.1 millimeters of mercury. Some of you may recall from your previous science coursework that there's something called a standard unit of atmospheric pressure called one atmosphere, which happens to be equivalent to 760 millimeters of mercury. Okay. And there are no base units for pressure. Just brief, uh, brief explanation. There are at least two physics majors in the class. Most of you probably had a physics class. Uh, in physics, pressure is, uh, let's see, force divided by area, and force is mass times acceleration. All of those things have base units. That, so you can break down pressure into a bunch of different base units. So we don't have a base unit for pressure. We have a standard unit for pressure of millimeters of mercury or atmospheres, but not a base unit. Okay. And the last one I put up here, we don't have an instrument to measure this one directly. It'd be nice if we did, but we don't. Okay, and let's see. And the quantity that it measures is, well, the quantity that it measures is the amount of matter in the sample. So we have a, a teaspoon of sugar or 10 grams of salt or just some, some chemical and we know it's mass. Well, how many molecules are there? How many atoms are there? That's a kind of an important thing to know, the bridge between the real world of mass and the chemistry and physics world of atoms and molecules. And you see, probably see where I'm going with this. This is called the mole. So our standard unit of measuring matter, which we don't have an instrument for, is called the mole. And wow, this gets a little complicated. The abbreviation for mole <laughs> is just M-O-L. So please get used to using that or just write the word mole. Unfortunately, the word mole is also the same thing as an abbreviation for molecule, which we'll almost never use that. Oh, an example of that, well, to be announced. That's a whole section of this course called stoichiometry, measuring matter. Going from here and here and here to here. So that's to be announced. And that's the base unit. And a good thing to know, some of you probably know this one, if you remember anything from your previous class, at one mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, I'm sorry, that should be 10 raised to the 23rd power, that scientific notation. And particles is just a placeholder. It could mean atoms, it could mean molecules, it could mean pieces of paper. It doesn't matter what it is. A mole of something is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd of those something. So I would, I would memorize that too. So I'd memorize that, memorize that. Okay. So, I'm going to stop the video here in a few minutes because I need to clean the board off and I don't want to have you watch me do that. So, you'll want to know what the base units are. Know these practical suggestions. Okay, that's, that's really useful. Probably good to know this now. We can do some problems with that. Uh, and I didn't get to the Greek prefixes in this lecture, so what I think I'm going to do in the next lesson is combine the Greek prefixes with um, unit conversions. So 2.54 centimeters equals one inch. 453.6 grams equals a pound. And how do we use all that just to convert between sets of units? Because it's, it's a way of scientific communication. It's really important to do. So I think we're just gonna combine those two there. So make sure you memorize those Greek prefixes, digest this. And if you wanna work ahead, we've got a bunch of problems with the PowerPoint slides. We're just gonna work some of those and then you're off and running on week one homework, okay? So I'm going to turn this off.